for a vibrant community where everyone belongs. And we at the Saskatoon Community Foundation are passionate stewards of philanthropy, helping every donor create their enduring legacy through charitable giving. So I want to take a little detour to make sure everyone who's here today understands where grants come from. All of the grants that we offer at Saskatoon Community Foundation come from gifts from donors. Now, those donors can be partners like the federal government in, in programs like the Community Services Recovery Fund. They can be corporate partners like Cameco through the Cameco Fund for Mental Health. And they can be our thousands of donors since we began our work in 1970. Uh, you'll notice that... We have granted over $59 million in donor-funded grants for our community since 1970, and each year we support over 300 charities and represent over 350 fund holders. So um, many of these donors will create endowed funds that generate grants for the community forever, and some of those funds will be designated to specific charities that are favorites of, of the donors. Sometimes donors give the foundation discretion on where the income from their fund will be granted. And so our three community grant programs are made up of these unrestricted and also field of interest funds. So a field of interest fund is sort of a semi-restricted fund where the donor has specified an area of interest where they want uh, the income to be granted but not a specific charity or a specific program. Uh, many of you will be familiar with Youth Endowment Saskatoon. And although that granting program is now made up of a number of different funds, the, the biggest one is actually a donor fund that was created from donor gifts in 2002 and first granted in 2004. But part of the changes we're talking about today will detail uh, some new funds that we've added there. Um, Many of you may be asking yourselves, well, why change the granting programs? Uh, there are a few reasons for doing this. Uh, our board is committed to serving uh, our Saskatoon community and its changing needs. And uh, as I referenced a couple of minutes ago, lots has changed and lots continues to change very rapidly uh, in, in the advent and the wake of uh, 2020 and the pandemic, which, uh, depending on who you talk to, is either over or still in full swing. Uh, we're responding to priorities that we've identified through our vital signs program and other community data that we gather. And uh, the new program that we're going to be introducing today, Vital Focus Grants, is going to help us to track outcomes and impact in some of those key areas of focus. So it's about bringing granting and donors and the data that we gather closer together to make sure that we're doing the best job we can to serve the identified needs in the Saskatoon community. I wanna mention that uh, in order to help everyone navigate some of the changes, we've create, created a new tool on the website. So uh, before you apply, but possibly not at this precise moment, go to our website and visit the Grant Seekers page and try the tool out. There are about five or six questions. It depends on how you answer the questions, how many of them you'll be asked. And it should help you to find the best grant opportunity for your organization for any particular project. If you find that after you use the tool, it's saying that the grant project isn't eligible or doesn't fit our programs, you can contact us. So contact my colleague, Chris Hertzke at donor services at Saskatoon Community Foundation.ca. Uh, Chris's title is donor services and grants coordinator, and she helps out a lot with the online administration of the granting programs through the website. So that's just a, a quick screenshot of um, the what the tool looks like. And you'll notice the question there, does your project serve people in the city of Saskatoon? Yes or no. 
Uh, it is fair to say that most of our granting programs are for Saskatoon. We're the Saskatoon Community Foundation, and it is, uh, I guess, one of the most uh, central questions that we like to answer before we start talking about the project. And for those who are wondering, yes, we do get contacted not only by people throughout the province of Saskatchewan, but people from further afield, including Ontario and BC, to see if they can um, apply to our programs. So a basic question or two can help answer most of the basic questions about whether you are eligible and whether uh, our programs are a good fit for the work that you're doing. So this slide's just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about Vital Focus Grants. This is our new program with an entirely new process. Youth Endowment Saskatoon. It's an expanded program with more total funding. Quality of Life, most of you will be familiar with. It's It's been around in some form or another, actually since 1973. Uh, and it's continuing, but it is smaller than it used to be somewhat, uh, ha has less total funding. And then finally, uh, the Community Fund for Reconciliation will no longer be granting as its own program. And so reconciliation projects should now apply to quality of life. And I had a phone call about this exact topic uh, within the last two hours from somebody who wanted to know what's happening. So the Community Fund for Reconciliation was a commitment that we made following our uh, 2017 gala, the Wasesquan Gala, uh, the first of four galas, each themed after a different uh, element. And we made a four-year commitment to grant a minimum of $100,000 a year, $400,000 over four years. Because of COVID, it ended up uh, being extended until after our final gala in the fall of 2022. And we have granted a total of $830,848 over those six years. So uh, now that the um, separate funding source for those grants ha no longer exists, uh, we can't offer that funding as a separate granting program. But our commitment to reconciliation and to building uh, a more inclusive community has not ended. And so, as I mentioned a minute ago, you can still apply with reconciliation projects to quality of life grants. And uh, in a certain sense, you could also apply to vital focus grants. So let's start with quality of life. Uh, many, many applicants have uh, applied to this program for many, many years. And, uh, you know, it's offered annual grants serving a wide range of organizations. For the last number of years, the maximum annual grants been 20,000, but starting in 2024, the maximum will be 10,000. And that's because we have a smaller amount of total funds that we're granting. We've moved some of those funds over to the new program. And we want to make sure that we can uh, send those funds to a number of different organizations in the community every year. The focus areas are belonging, inclusion, and reconciliation. And so, as I've mentioned a couple of times, reconciliation projects should now apply to quality of life grants because the Community Fund for Reconciliation will not be granting in 2024. If you think of belonging and inclusion, in some ways that represents what most charitable organizations are doing with their work. It's about how people belong to community, how they fit in. And so I want you to think of that as a lens through which we're looking at the applications. We're looking for how what you do fosters inclusion and belonging. And that can mean social and cultural inclusion. Uh, inclusion is a factor when you think of um, people living in poverty who, by the nature of their um, lower income, are excluded from some parts of the quality of life that we share in Saskatoon. It can refer to people who are of one gender or another, who are older, who are living with health conditions or disabilities. So it's a broad category. But um, think of what we're doing as fostering belonging, inclusion, 
and reconciliation. So the process, and some of you will be familiar with this, uh, we'll be opening quality of life grants and vital focus grants on December 1st in just a few days. There will be a letter of intent. That's a short form that um, will be reviewed. And then from those letters of intent, we'll select a smaller number for full applications. So in some ways, that's good for both applicants and for the review committee. The review committee doesn't need to read as many full applications if we just don't have the resources to fund them. And applicants don't have to complete a full application if really there's not a good chance that you can be successful. The fact that you're invited to submit a full application doesn't mean that you will be successful in receiving a grant or that you'll receive 100% of what you ask for, but it certainly uh, should be an encouragement that we're interested in looking at funding your project. So you get the letters of intent in by February 1st. We will get back to you no later than February 15th to let you know whether or not you're being requested to submit a full application. And if requested, those applications are due March 1st. And we should have grant decisions by early May for quality of life. What's changed? Well, we have less total funds available to grant. We have a smaller maximum grant size of $10,000. I want to make a special point of saying that all of those field of interest funds that donors have designated to children and youth have now been moved over to Youth Endowment Saskatoon. And that's part of the reason that quality of life is smaller. There have been a few applicants who are all about children and youth who have traditionally applied to quality of life. Those applicants will have to be aware of this and now make sure that they apply to Youth Endowment Saskatoon. And as I've mentioned a couple of times, reconciliation projects should apply to quality of life. Next up, uh, by the way, folks, I do realize that I'm speaking quickly. It's kind of a barrage of information. I do want you to know that some form of this information will be posted to our website. Uh, if we get a good recording, we may post this session or we may uh, post a, a version of the PowerPoint. But uh, don't worry if you don't catch it all. It's not a secret. We'll we'll let you know and we'll answer your questions. Uh, so, and I am trying to get through things in a prompt and orderly fashion. So we have time left over toward the end of the session for you to ask any questions that you may have. So next up, Youth Endowment Saskatoon. Youth Endowment Saskatoon is... Uh, a fairly long-standing program at this point. It first granted in 2004. And by the way, it's always been uh, decided by our Youth Advisory Council. So each year, the Youth Advisory Council defines its annual areas of focus. Young people themselves, this is part of our commitment to children and youth, young people themselves will, through their lens, decide what's important for children and youth in Saskatoon. They'll accept the applications, review them, and uh, make recommendations to our board of directors for the funding. So the opening date is going to be January 2nd. Now, I mentioned that both of the other programs are due are, are opening, sorry, December 1st. We have Youth Endowment opening a little bit later because it takes time for that youth council to define its areas of focus. They come together in the fall, get to know one another, learn about charities and about grants, and talk about their values and come around to their decisions about what they want to focus on each year. Um, the process is simpler for youth endowment. It's application only. There's no letter of intent phase to it. So you simply submit the, the full application. They review them and we see what the outcome is. Um, some years ago, when I first came to the foundation, youth endowment was granting 
only about 35,000 a year, but with the new funds that we've moved over and uh, some other changes we've made, it's going to grant around $100,000 in 2024. And so for the first time ever, we've added a maximum grant size. You know, when we had $35,000 and the, the young folks wanted to support a number of different things, the maximum grant size kind of sorted itself out. But now that uh, the the total funds are much higher. We've set a maximum grant size of 10,000 to make sure that uh, the funds go to a number of different agencies uh, who may want to apply. So uh, what's changed? Well, there's more donor funding available through YES. By the way, that, that term YES for Youth Endowment Saskatoon was actually invented by a former member of the Youth Council. Uh, so, uh, you know, Credit, I guess, to Kelly Zhang, wherever she is now. Uh, all projects for children and youth should apply to YES, and the maximum grant size, which didn't exist before this year, is $10,000. Um, now we come to our brand new program called Vital Focus Grants, and it's so named because we want to make sure people understand there's a connection between the focus areas that we have for Vital Focus Grants and our Vital Signs program. I keep saying Vital Signs program because I think many people may be familiar with the Vital Signs report, and we recently released uh, what's called a Vital Focus, which is a, a shorter, more focused report on homelessness. Uh, and so the program itself is bigger than just the report. It involves community conversations with different groups of stakeholders. It involves ongoing data collection and analysis by experts. And when I say experts, I mean other people than me, uh, people who, who gather the data, people who are data professionals here in the city of Saskatoon. So Vital Focus Grants is a new community grant program in 2024. It's based on a data-driven approach that's informed by the Saskatoon Vital Signs Report in order to respond to what we've seen as the top priorities in our community. And so based on the 2021 Vital Signs Report, the focus areas in 2024 will be homelessness, mental health, and equity. And uh, don't worry, I'm going to get into those uh, three areas and talk about them a little bit in a moment. But I do want to start by um, pointing out the, the key highlights for Vital Focus Grants. We want to support projects with a longer-term impact. We're going to provide multi-year funding agreements between three and five years. And we're also going to be looking to track the outcomes of those projects over the three to five-year period of the funding. The maximum grant size is 20000 per year to a maximum of five years. So you can actually apply for $100,000 through this program. So we think of these grants as partnerships with the foundation. It's a long-term relationship, five years. I've known people who weren't married that long. As I said a minute ago, there's a maximum uh, size to this partnership of $100,000 over the five years. We hope that those longer partnerships will ease the burden of applications, improve outcomes for your organization and your client, and improve both yours and our ability to measure outcomes and the impact of the support that we provide. So I'm going to delve uh, ultimately quite briefly into uh the three focus areas. And I say briefly because we could spend an hour each talking about uh, the various dimensions of equity, homelessness, and mental health. We just don't have that kind of time. Uh, so I just want to point out, looking at, at the uh, graphic here, the difference between equality and equity, right? Um, of course, it's figurative, Uh these don't represent actual people, uh, but we see people of different backgrounds who uh, are starting out at different levels. 
in the equality side of the picture, they're all standing on the same size pedestal. They're all getting the same amount of support. And so they remain at different levels because they started out in different places and they're given the same. They remain uh, unequal, <laughs> I guess, uh, because they're offered equal support. In the equity version of uh, the, the graphic, uh, each person is given a different level of support based on uh, where they're starting out so that each person is able to achieve a similar level. And so equity um, really refers to the fact that the systems in our society are set up to be biased against certain individuals, right? I mean, if you if you think of the greatest equity seeking category uh, in in society, it, it actually still is uh, women, right? Uh, women still don't receive equal pay for equal work in, in uh, similar roles, despite all the changes over the last 50 or 60 years of uh, the equal rights movement. Uh, but there are many other groups who seek equity. They could be racialized peoples, different cultures. They could be um, people living in poverty. You know, our systems are to a dismaying extent set up uh, to be biased against people who are living in poverty and to make it very hard for people to get out of poverty. So working for equity means helping equity seeking groups address these systemic biases against success. It means ensuring culturally inclusive spaces and actively forwarding anti-racist work in the community. So you, if you're considering applying for vital focus grants, you want to um, think carefully about how you're going to measure the impact of the work that you're doing. Homelessness. The infographic that you're looking at here comes from our 2021 vital signs report, but actually new data from the 2022 point in time count shows now over 550 people identifying as homeless. And at this point, over 90% of them are indigenous. In both cases, the 500 and the 550, we recognize that there are many, many more people than that who may still be homeless. They may be couch surfing. Uh, you know, from place to place, staying with people for a short time. Uh, they may be housing insecure where they cannot afford the housing that they're in. And they're in an unsustainable situation where they can't pay their light bill. They can't pay for food in order to have shelter. Because so many of the people who are homeless or housing insecure in Saskatoon are in Indigenous, it makes sense that solutions for homelessness must involve Indigenous leadership and embrace Indigenous worldviews. Uh, and there are three main areas, one of them is referenced on the graphic, three main areas in, in our systems where people are kind of leaking into homelessness, when people are re released from incarceration, when they're coming out of long-term healthcare situations and have no home left to go to and people who are aging out of the foster care system. And many, many people who are homeless now were first exposed uh, to homelessness as a consequence of leaving the foster care system. Homelessness has now been identified as a top issue in the community by many polls and surveys. Research that we've done, research that the city's done, people are talking about it. And I think it's, it's fairly self-evident as you look at um, the situation on our streets. So you're going to notice that homelessness, mental health, and equity are all interrelated in a lot of situations. Uh, and, you know, you're going to have to decide how you're going to frame what you do and how you fit into those categories if you want to apply to this granting program. What's going to change? We know that if we give you $20,000 a year, those aren't the capital costs for building new housing, right? So what will you do to support the people who are looking for uh, adequate and suitable housing? What's going to change for them? How are you going to measure those changes? 
mental health really rose to the top as an issue and and during pandemic and people have been talking about it since then this comes from stats can 2020 and they noted that 53 people of canadians more than half of us say that our mental health is somewhat worse now or much worse now than it was compared to pre-pandemic and when you consider how many people are touched by mental health issues and mental health needs even prior to the pandemic, it's an area where we're expecting ripples for many years. And we want to do the best we can to support people living with mental health needs. So I realize that that is a very, very quick tour through some very complex issues. But, uh, you know, to be blunt about it, all of you doing work out in the community understand this just as well as we do. And uh, we're more than willing to talk over your project with you. So, you know, let's, I'm looking forward to those conversations and, and to helping uh, whoever I can to produce the most effective applications that they can in 2024. I do want to mention uh, an important point about the funding for vital focus grants. And that is, I mentioned to you as we began this uh, session that our grants come from endowed funds, permanently endowed funds created by donors. And so each year, those funds earn income and a portion of that income goes to fund the grants. So we can't commit funds for that we haven't earned yet for future years. So we have to pay for each of these multi-year um, partnerships from this year's allocation. And what that's going to mean is that we can only start a few multi-year projects each year. Over the course of five years, we'll have a wide wide range of projects running concurrently at different stages of their five-year cycles. But uh, in year one, we're only going to be able to start a few because we have to make sure that when we commit to giving you five-year funding, we've got that funding for the full five years. So it's a new process. It's going to open Friday, December 1st. Pardon me. There will be an LOI, and it's a little bit more detailed than the LOI for quality of life grants because uh, the process of uh, identifying the shorter list is going to have to be a little bit more uh, rigorous. We're going to have to identify no more than five to six. If we think that we can fund maybe three, maybe four, if they were all three-year projects, maybe we could fund five in the first year. But I tend to think that people will ask for five-year funding. So we need to narrow that list significantly. We'll get back to you by March 15th. Huh. And then between March 16th and April 10th, we're planning to have meetings with all of the shortlisted applicants. So part of the LOI, by the way, will be identifying some time slots where you could have a two-hour meeting with us. Uh, pardon me, I'm getting a bit of a dry throat, folks. So we're taking a couple of weeks here, a few weeks actually, probably close to four weeks, to have time to schedule these meetings, have a full and complete discussion we doing okay? Uh, sorry, uh, just checking with somebody. <clears throat> a full and complete discussion of the projects with you. You can ask us questions. We can ask you about what you're uh, planning to produce for outcomes. Uh, and uh, any aspect of the program. So it differs from our former applications in that we're not just asking you to submit an application, you write what you write, and we see what we think of it. We're going to talk through things. The process is going to use a spreadsheet, actually, that is going to help us um, determine what are your outcomes? 
What are the indicators for the outcomes? How are you going to measure those indicators? And who is going to experience those outcomes for each of the five years of your project? So we can talk through that in the discovery meeting. And then when we get to the point where um, you're actually asked to submit a full application, you should have a very clear idea of what you're going to do. And we should as well. So from that short list of five to six, some will be asked to submit full applications. And if they're requested, they'll be due May 1st. Even at this stage, someone who has been requested to uh, submit a full application is not guaranteed success. But you can imagine that we are, um, we're narrowing the field to make sure that we know what we're asking for and that your chances of success by that point are quite good. Grant decisions will come out early May, and there will be an annual report back that you'll have to do. So you won't have to reapply, but you'll have to submit a report for each year of the program. Uh, I did want to mention a bit more about this spreadsheet that we're, we're developing. Uh, like I said, we'll <clears throat> have this meeting where we'll discuss the different aspects of your project, what you want to achieve how you'll know you achieved it, how you'll measure that, and you'll provide us with projections for the overall project in each of the years, whether it's three years or five years. Uh, then when you report back, you'll use that same spreadsheet to track it. So you'll have the original submission that you made in 2024 and the actual numbers for each year of your project. We want as much as possible to make measurement objective. So it's a good idea to think about how you can do that. Can you show before and after data um, outputs, like how many people attend a program or how many people, you know, um, achieve uh, a certain, oh, I'm not sure, uh, you know, how, how many people uh, receive a certain type of support things like that. They're not necessarily bad, but they don't necessarily show change as clearly as measured data. Uh, you're also going to be asked to include demographic information about the clients that you serve. So um, that's going to be an important feature of this program both in terms of keeping a consistency from what was originally submitted throughout the length of this five-year program, but also um, moving toward more objective measurement. So quick recap. Uh, I realize it's been a lot of information. Uh, vital Focus Grants. It's a new program with a new process. It uses vital signs areas of focus and offers larger multi-year grant partnerships. Youth Endowment. It's an expanded program with more total funding, but now all projects for children and youth should apply to Youth Endowment. Quality of Life continues to be our broad core program. It has smaller grants now because it has less total funds, and reconciliation projects should apply to Quality of Life. Uh, it's also true that reconciliation is a part of equity. And so it's possible that a reconciliation project could apply to Vital Focus, but realize that only a few uh, projects will succeed each year through Vital Focus grants. So you don't want to miss your quality of life deadline and, and have all of your hopes pinned on a Vital Focus grant being successful. And then lastly, Community Fund for Reconciliation will no longer operate as a separate granting program. There is a permanently endowed fund that was created from part of the funds from those galas. And through that fund, we will continue in perpetuity to support reconciliation and better relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous citizens of our region. But uh, the, the separate program will not run anymore after 2023. So <clears throat> I do want to take a minute uh, 
and, and I am conscious of the time here. I want to leave time for questions and answers, and I hope there are some good ones uh, piling up in the chat. Uh, but I do want to take a minute to talk about the process for reviewing and reporting. Reviewing grant applications thoughtfully takes time. Realize that uh, although I'm paid to do this job, the committees, whether it's the Youth Advisory Council or our other grants committees, are made up of community volunteers, and they're doing this work in their spare time to benefit community. So that's going to take time. And, uh, uh, you know, we're often oversubscribed uh, by three to four to one. What I mean by that is that if we have say $600,000 that we're going to grant through these programs, we may receive requests between two and 2.5 million. And, and so hard decisions have to be made in every process. For those that succeed, there are others that will not succeed and that's never easy. Uh, so it takes time to review and part of that process can include us asking for clarification or more information Particularly, by the way, folks, if you don't send us clear uh, add-ons to your to your uh, supporting documents, like uh, clear budget statements, things like that. So when we ask for uh, information that we didn't get in the first submission, uh, we come back to you. It may take you some time to get that information back to us. Then we send it back to the reviewers. It It's a process that takes time. So we hope you can be patient. I get many, many calls uh, every every season uh, asking, when will we know? And uh, we do our very best to be efficient and get responses back within roughly two months in most cases. But uh, it just, it takes the time that it takes. All of the committees recommend grants to our board and the board of directors approves the grant recommendations decisions of the board of directors are final. And the main reason why that is, it's not to be, uh, you know, rigid so much as once the board approves those grants, we spend the money. We don't keep, you know, an extra pool of money that we're not granting in case, you know, something else comes up. This is why we have an intake. Uh, we find out as best we can what is needed by organizations in the community, and then we spend the money that we have to spend. I hope my description of the Vital Focus grants program highlights how important it is for Saskatoon Community Foundation that you um, report thoughtfully in a timely way and with complete information. It's, it's really important because it's not only about the successful functioning of your program, it's the impact that our granting makes that we uh, take back to our donors in order to receive future gifts from them that generate more grants for you and your organizations. So it is part of this relationship that we have as grantor and grant recipients. We are not uh, about... Um, sort of trying to police these things. It's about tell us what's going on so we can tell everyone the good news about what you achieved and what you're doing. We want to be in this together for the benefit of all our organizations and communities. Uh, my colleague Joy is mentioning that I am talking a bit long and it's time to move on with the last few slides. Uh, so that we have time left for questions before the hour is up. So I wanted to add in a few things here that are not new, but still good to know. Uh, you want to check your eligibility to apply. Uh, it's a frequent question, you know, am I eligible to apply? And right now, as per CRA guidelines and the Income Tax Act of Canada, we can provide grants only to qualified donees. Qualified donees in this context means registered charities, it means municipalities, and it means some other organizations performing a function of municipal government. So for example, some tribal councils and First Nations have applied for qualified donee status and received it, but not all. 
So if you are not a qualified donee, it may be possible to present your programming through a qualified donee who partners with you and is willing to receive the grant funds uh, for the benefit of your program. But for the most part, that's the exception, not the rule. Please do diarize the deadline dates for the programs and make sure you apply on time. Unfortunately, you know, if we allow a grant application the day after, then what's to stop us for, from allowing one the day after that or the week after that? Pools of applications are reviewed as groups, right? The committee looks at this bunch of applications and says, with this piece of funding, what's the best stuff that we can do? What are the best decisions that we can make? So uh, they have limited time. We are trying to get things back to you. And that's the biggest reason why we don't accept late applications. If you want email notifications uh, for when grant programs open, you can either contact Chris or we're going to be sending out a survey after this session. And one of the questions will allow you to sign up for those email notifications. Okay. And please do use the new where to apply tool on the four grant seekers webpage in our website. Okay. In order to um, apply, you'll need to set up an online account. All grant applications are accepted online only, not by email, not in paper. So you'll have to set up an account. If you have applied before, but for a former organization, you need a new account. Okay. If another person from your organization has applied, you need an account in your name. The person whose name is on the application may need to respond in a timely way to any questions that we might have. So, uh, you know, it needs to, it needs to be you. Okay. Once your account's created, you can log in and access any applications for programs currently open. But note that programs are open for a four to eight week intake period, depending on the program. None of them are open year round. We don't want to have something open now that we're not going to respond to until next fall. So we open them for, for a brief but reasonable period before the intake deadline. In my opinion, your best practice is to prepare all of your supporting materials before you begin your application. Make sure you've got a balanced budget for your project, your current year's operations budget for your organization. I have had uh, people who represent quite good-sized organizations say, uh, we don't have an operations budget. That's not going to be okay, so you'll have to figure that out. You'll want your most recent audited financial statement for your organization per CRA regulations, right? If you're at a certain level, you'll need a review engagement or a, a statement signed by your board, but whatever's the appropriate level for your organization as per CRA. If you have a program presented in schools, you need a, a letter of support from the relevant school foundation or division, not a school principal. You should always have a, a description of your ability activities of your project. What are you going to do to produce the outcomes? You should have uh, a clear description of the outcomes you expect and your plan for evaluating them. And depending on the application, you may need your organization's board of directors list. Make sure you have time. Last minute issues with supporting documents or tech. Don't excuse late applications. And you want to be aware of the maximum grant size for each program. If you apply for $50,000 for to a program that can only grant 10, it's guaranteed your budget isn't balanced and there's $40,000 that you haven't thought about where you're going to go to get that. It it affects our view of whether this is fundable and viable. So, you know, watch out for those maximums and make sure that you fit the focus areas. So, uh <clears throat> again, I know going quite fast, but uh, I, I wanted to make sure I had at least some time to uh, address questions. So um, I have a question from Michelle. I'm not sure which Michelle that is, Joy, but that's okay. I'll, to any Michelle in the audience, I'm going to uh, present her question and, and try to answer. Do these projects need to be new or can groups apply for core funding for programs already happening in the community? The answer is they don't need to be new, but if you have a core program that's already running, 
uh, then presumably you already have core funding for it. So what are we funding? That's the question. Is there some new facet to the program? Is it that you've lost a piece of funding that we can help uh, maintain a program so that it, it isn't lost? You know, what's the value at? We're practically never that interested in covering off revenues that you already have from some other uh, source. So I, I think that's the fairest answer uh, to that question. Uh, Janine asks, can you apply for more than one type of grant in a year? For example, can you apply to all of quality of life, yes, and vital focus? Uh, you, you can if you want. Uh, obviously, you're not likely to come with the exact same project to all three of those because, you know, children and youth only applies in one case. And if it's not for children and youth, it's it's not for youth endowment. But if, if this is Janine Bowman from Family Service, you may have projects in more than one category. Uh, I've also been asked at the, at the previous session, can you put in more than one application to a particular granting program? Again, the answer is there's nothing in policy that says you can't. It's probably not the best idea, though, because if, um, you know, th we're trying to fund a number of different organizations and the odds of you receiving two grants and other organizations receiving none are slim. And it has happened in the past that organizations have applied for two things and the committees decided to fund the thing that they already have lots of support for or they feel you know, well supported in from other funders and has not supported the thing that they don't have any funding for. And so it, it has worked out in awkward ways. So probably not the best way to go. Um, there's a comment from CMHA, Canadian Mental Health Association, and the comment is, that the vital focus grant application process requires very sophisticated internal capacities for local agencies that are invested in day-to-day -day service delivery. Experience with logic models will be essential. I'm going to say, yes, that's the case. Um, you're offering, in, in your case, CMHA, or, or in the case of many organizations who are attending today, you're offering... Um, services to people with complex needs. And it is necessary that you have a good understanding of the theoretical underpinnings of the service you provide. And it's also necessary that you understand what's the impact that you're having and how, how are you going about achieving that impact? So I know that what I described can sound daunting. That's why we want to have these meetings with you and talk things through. It's still the same people, right? It's it's still Dawn and Chris and Joy and and Carm and Jen and Samir, uh, and you know we haven't suddenly become uh, this organization on a different level. We want to talk through these things and and make sure we're clear. We might even schedule a second meeting if we weren't clear enough about what the outcome was, or or if you weren't clear enough about what you need to do in the first meeting. So we want to make sure that by the time we're interested in talking to you about your five-year project and uh, you know, you're know you prepared to make a submission that covers this long-term granting relationship, that we're all clear about what's going to happen. It's not meant to be a mystery and we will work through it together. I hope that's a good response to that comment. Uh, Debbie's asking, are the application guidelines available online? And is it possible to set up Zoom calls throughout the application process? So the answer to the first is that these things are not necessarily complete and posted completely on the website as of today, but they will be as of December 1st. We are still finalizing uh, an applicant guide and a frequently asked question sheet and uh you know, putting the finishing touches on on uh, some of the pieces, but it will all be ready to go December 1st. Your other question, is it possible to set up Zoom calls throughout uh, the application process? I would say the best bet is to send an email to Chris or possibly myself first with any specific questions. 
if I'm being honest, we don't have the capacity to do a one hour Zoom meeting with every potential applicant for every potential program. It wouldn't work out. So if we can answer your question simply in an email, we will. If we need to, to make a meeting, we may make a meeting, but it may just be a phone call. It could be a Zoom. So I, it's not that I don't want to talk to you, Debbie, uh, but uh, we we will do what we have the capacity to do. So it, as applicants, uh, if I can say this, it's your job to do the best you can at developing a clear idea of what your project is, what impact you want to have, how you'll measure those outcomes, and how it's going to benefit community. If you have questions in the midst of that, we'll do our best to answer them. If I'm honest, the most frequently asked question from all applicants to me over my 15 years here at the foundation is some kind of version of, if I do this, will I get a grant? And I can never answer that question because I don't know what committees will do. I don't know what the full pool of applications is going to look like. And uh, it's it's ultimately up to the volunteer committees to decide who will get a grant. Not getting a grant, particularly with vital focus, if, if you don't succeed in your first year, it's no reflection on you or your project. It's a reflection on the fact that we only have a small number of projects that we can start each year. And, you know, we may even say, please come back next year because we want to fund it, but we didn't have enough. But in the other programs, we're still oversubscribed three or four to one. Uh, we, we have requests for three or four times the resources that we actually have to grant. And so we'll do the best. Um, a person identified by the initial J is asking, could organizations partner together on a program and make a joint application? So actually, that would be great. The fact is, we've got to send uh, a grant payment to somebody. And uh, it's most likely going to have to go to one organization. It, it, if you're thinking of, for example, a, a $10,000 quality of life grant, it's not necessarily going to make a lot of sense to send $7,000 to one and $3,000 to the other. What's going to happen is that there's going to be a primary partner uh, who's the main applicant, they're going to receive the grant. And if they want to use that other partner as an agent to deliver part of the programming, then they can provide them with that $3,000 or whatever piece of it is appropriate. But uh, we have always asked about partnerships. And if you have a good partnership, that it makes for a very strong application. So I hope that's a satisfying answer uh, to that question. Uh, I've, I've come to the end of the questions that have been forwarded to, to me so far, and it's just about uh, five minutes to four. So I'm wondering, are there any last questions? It would be okay at this point if somebody wanted to pipe up, uh, unmute themselves and ask a question. At this point, I'm going to just uh, flip past to our last slide, uh, which has the link for the the survey this is going to be emailed out to you uh but uh, if you want to grab it now you certainly can we'd like to hear feedback on what we've presented here um and i thought i'd just stop the share and uh just say hi to everybody before it's all over joy do we have any more questions in the chat right now okay i, I think you've got it covered don thank you great well, thanks everybody then for joining us today. I hope that this was good information. Uh, the one question I was asked at our other session uh, was, am I planning to do any grant writing workshops? I had offered those uh, some years ago prior to pandemic, and I am considering uh, offering one in January. So, uh, you know, we'll we'll keep you uh, informed about that. Sign up for email notifications, and that way you'll be sure to know when it will be happening. Uh, have a great day, everybody, and uh, I look forward to seeing your applications in 2024.
Okay. Thanks again, everybody. And I'm going to sign off.